NEC, and I'm your host for the Pepsi Music Lab Summit. Uh, during the summit, we are talking a little bit about building your team and different kind of deals artists may sign with a label. Those sorts of deals depend to a great extent on the type of label you're signing with. Should you be aiming to sign with a major label, taking advantage of all their resources and connections, or are you better suited to an independent working outside the machine? To answer these questions, we have two people with unparalleled experience in the major and independent label worlds. Welcome to our panelists. Charlene Thomas is one of the most influential executives in hip hop. She signed an a and 36 Mafia and Lil Flip at Lao Records, ran a 50 ro artist roster that included Wu-Tang Clan, Mob Deep, Funk Flex, and Big Pun. Uh, she also spearheaded marketing campaigns for heavyweights like Jay-Z and Rick Ross. Thomas has worked as a consultant for brands like Pepsi, Hugo Boss, and Levi, uh, and also with sports stars such as Floyd Mayweather, Kenny Smith, Kenyon Martin, and is now the vice president of marketing at Def Jam, where she is developing marketing strategies for Kanye West, Big Sean, Hit Boy, LL Cool J, 2 Chains, and Jeezy. We also have Junior Abedu who started Love Renaissance nine years ago with four of his classmates from Georgia State University. Since then, it's grown to one of R&B's most important record labels, boasting platinum selling artists like Black, Summer Walker, and BRS Cash, and managing Shelly FKA Drum, Westside Boogie, and Division. In 2017, Love Renaissance signed a distribution deal with Interscope Records and launched LVRN Studios, a creative space in Atlanta. Since then, Junior has helped the label to expand further, signing artists like Cruel Santino, Kitty Cash, and OMB Bloodbath. Uh, I'd like to welcome both of you guys to the panel and, and, and to the summit. Uh, Junior, let's get straight to it. Can you explain what an independent label is and uh, break down the difference from a major? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, but yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, the difference between an independent label and a major is that an independent label essentially distributes music and, and signs artists and represents artists and their and puts out their music um, without the ownership or in some uh, cases the funding of one of the major labels um, that are out there so essentially you know it's a smaller version of what a major label does okay and Charlene, can you kind of weigh in on that from, from the major side? How does that differ from an independent? First, uh, thank you as well. Um, in short, the difference between a major and an indie would, would be the structure. So for a major, we're typically owned by corporations, uh, bigger companies, firms, or, and we typically or could have a board of directors. And indies are, are usually owned by individuals people like a smaller group you can have an indie that lives under a major but essentially the the essence of an indie is individual individuality whereas a major it's unlimited resources per se <laughs> you know i don't want everyone to think the bank is never ending um worldwide exposure and our relationship relationships the the benefit of coming to the uh, majors is that we have numerous departments and just like a powerhouse that can help support an artist when you're with us. Well, it's nice that you touched on some of the benefits from a major, but Junior, uh, can you touch on some of the benefits from uh, signing with an independent as well? Yeah, uh, for sure. So, you know, it definitely depends on the situation in the indie, um, the indie label you're talking about. But um, generally speaking, some of the, the benefits are you usually have a smaller team of people who might be a little bit more, um, depending on the situation, a little bit more hands-on depending on the size of their roster. You typically have a smaller roster on an indie um, than you would at a major label where they represent a ton of different artists through, you know, across a ton of different genres typically. Um, so you might just have like a, a little bit more of a homegrown feeling at an indie um, than you do at a major. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and I'm gonna ask these questions to both the both of you all. Um, are there any drawbacks that you feel like Charlene from uh, signing with a major or or you know operating a major label? Um, so essentially, just kind of what touching on what Junior was saying is, at an independent, it's about ownership and creative control. Where the difference would be in comparison to a major, 
that's ideally what any artist wants. You know, you want to be significantly in control of your future and career. Um, for myself, I will say I've seen both sides of it on at our major because I, when I was at Loud, that was considered a joint venture in partnership with a major. So we had, we weren't inside the building per se, as they would say. So you had the homegrown feel, you had the family aspect, you had creative control, but we were still a major. Um, and then being fully inside where you're like in the universal system, the, that would, you know, the, the heavier rosters, um, maybe you don't feel you have so much ownership or individuality, which would probably be what an artist would say would be the drawback. And, and even process, you know, because you are a part, a part of a corporation, the legalities are different. We are definitely by the book, cross our I's and dots our, dot our T's, where the indie, they may take more risk. So for an artist, they may feel the drawback to them is, you know, I might have to have, in order to schedule your record, I might need it three weeks. Maybe the indie can bring it out in two days. So, you know, just from an artist's perspective, that's what they would think would be the biggest difference in our drawbacks. However, with saying that, we're still a full system and our goal is to make your brand bigger because we can reach those worldwide aspects. I feel like we got some bidding going on, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know who's like, seeing this, so I kind of you gotta you know make sure I stay like. No, oh, come to the major. Come over here, <laughs> <laughs> Julia. Do you feel like there are any drawbacks uh, from an artist maybe going the independent route? Um, yeah, I mean, there's drawbacks with with everything. I think uh, to Charlene's point, you know, we have the uh, we at LBR Records we have the ability to kind of upstream things through a major label system or to work things independently. Um, and so we have experience with both. I think, you know, the drawbacks, I'm sorry, was the drawbacks to a major or to an indie? To an indie. To an indie. Um, yeah, the drawbacks is definitely, can be the reach. It can be the, uh, the amount of resources that you have in terms of, you know, boots on the ground, in terms, you know, the, the ability to reach different cities with a bigger staff or, you know, a global staff even that you kind of, essentially get from a major that you don't always get with indies. Um, you know, certain relationships are things, you know, majors have long standing history, um, you know, with different relationships, different um, partners that are important. And that's essentially, you know, what you're expecting when you, when you go with the major that you, do, you can't necessarily always expect with the indie the way that you can with the major. Right. And um, it's interesting that that you mentioned that also like trying to get that that global reach and um, having different partnerships that that are are possible sometimes and may be a little bit difficult um, because because you are co-founder of Love Renaissance. And uh, back in 2017, you guys did sign a distribution deal with uh, Interscope Records. So because you guys did that, how did that change what you all do on a day to day and, and fundamentally? Yeah, I mean. It changed a lot of our process. Um, again, to Charlie's point, there's there's a very specific um, kind of protocol that most majors follow in terms of you know lead time needed for a release or you know certain budget approvals and things like that. Um, even certain creative processes, you know, and, and approvals in that regard. So um, it changed the way we thought about process and the way we thought about you know the different levers that we had to basically align before we put something out whether that's clearances or um, communicating to across departments, you know, there's, there's a level of protocol that we had to embrace with that partnership. Um, but I think that, you know, we we're able to kind of hold on to our autonomy and our creative thinking and the way that we, you know, our, our kind of uh, DNA is a, as an underground company that was really kind of, you know, built off of guerrilla marketing in a sense. And so we could really kind of, keep that element and think within that space. But um, when you're partnering with a major, you know, you have to check certain boxes to make sure you're aligned when you're putting stuff out. Do you, do you feel like that partnership actually uh, provided your artists with more opportunities? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, it definitely did. I mean, there's, there was, uh, you know, the, the obvious thing is resources, money to shoot better videos to, um, you know, support bigger tours, 
uh, things of that nature, um, put on bigger marketing efforts. Those types of things helped. There's, um, you know, a relationship aspect, but we also pride ourselves as being a company that has a lot of internal relationships, has a lot of internal know-how of how to, you know, make a dollar stretch, get things done, whether it's videos, you know, marketing efforts, like I said before. So it was really us trying to figure out the best way to, the best resources to pull from and, and where to keep things um, internal and independent and keep that feel so that we didn't lose that, you know, essentially good graces if you, if you, you know, if you're looking at it at a certain way with certain people who, um, you know, who really appreciate the indie uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, you know, these relationships between uh, the labels, you know, they differ uh, and these partnerships differ from label to label. And uh, Def Jam is actually owned by Universal. You kind of mentioned that earlier, Charlene. Can you touch on how um, this relationship between Def Jam and, and Universal is a little bit different than what Junior has uh, between Love Renaissance and Interscope? So honestly, to be really honest, we're in the same system. So my protocols are going to be is um, our shared services are shared. So right. our production schedules are the same. Um, our creative systems are the same. Uh, we The one thing about Universal on a whole, just probably for the Interscope, Republic, Def Jam, Capital System, uh, we have the ability, we have a, a part of us called the center. So there's some things that we have that we share in terms of services and, and opportunities, depending on the artist, right? Um, I will say probably the difference between a Def Jam and LVRN would be only just the, the years. You know, Def Jam has been a staple in the universal system. Um, it's going on 40 years. So probably just this term of just the legacy would be different. But in terms of just the things we have to do on a day to day basis, we share the same system. And That's from me being at other systems. It's not really that much different. You know, it's you're going to have your same guidelines. It's not the, the company per se that changes the systems. It's the time. So because we're in more of a digital era and artists want to get out music faster, like those timelines are different probably than it was 10, 20 years ago. So that would be the, yeah. it, it just, it's the state of music that changes, not really the company. We have to change because of whatever state we're in. Right. It's interesting that you mentioned the time because, uh, you know, being a part of Loud Records in the early 90s and then Def... <laughs> Listen, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that, but it's iconic <laughs> and it's legendary, the, the, the things that you've done and the things that you've accomplished. And obviously you hold a, a an immense amount of, of wisdom and, you know, you can drop a lot of gems here for the upcoming artists who are who are tuned in. So uh, have you seen any differences in how the relationship between the artist and the label has changed since, you know, the 90s till today? Yes, it's very different um, from when I started. And I didn't start early 90s. I just have to throw that out there. <laughs> um, there's a really big difference. One, again, the digital era, social era has make, made a lot easier. You know, our reach to artists now spans globally as before pre-digital era. You know, it was someone sent in a, a tape. I don't know if anyone young may know what a tape is, but I know what a tape is. They sent in a demo in whatever form you want to, you know, it was in, right? And that's how we got to labels. And or it was an artist being out in a, a nightlife or, you know, coming up to you and please listen to my there's a song, please listen to my demo. That was the way we received music back then. Today, it's a lot easier. We have all of these different platforms. We have all of these tools inside the labels that show us up and coming artists, the data, the analytics. We didn't have that before. Um, I would say it was more talent driven. When I started, you had to really, really see something and believe something. And I think that's still what the indies today do. They they find artists that that are trend makers, right? Um, to where today with the bigger machines, you know, we are we do lean a lot more heavy on data. I'm not going to say there aren't artists that are assigned because of just pure talent, but we do lean we we are heavy on data. Mm, okay. 
Yeah, I, I feel like uh, something that's that's been reoccurring. I've been hearing uh, a lot more people lean on data and, and seeing what's going on with the analytics. Um, and something else that has been more uh, more common lately, Julian, maybe you could uh, weigh in on this, is uh, how I've seen people kind of start their own labels more frequently. So what advice would you give someone who is, uh, you know, thinking about starting a label soon? Um, That's a great question. I mean, I think that, it, it, I think defining your your uh, approach is really important. I think what's important to you as an executive or as an owner of a label, um, what you think is important to the brand that you're building is, is important to establish early on. Um, for us, we kind of carved out a, a niche where we wanted to really, really be focused on um, storytelling um, and essentially not so much focusing in on KPIs and, and trying to necessarily um, chase after artists who have um, something trending, whether it's socially or, or you know, via uh, a streaming platform, but more so identifying artists who we see something special in the story that they're trying to tell. And we feel like we're the right ones to tell that story um, through marketing efforts, through, uh, you know, the type of music that we're, we're, we're going to help them make in a and um, <clears throat> everything across the board. And so, you know, that was important for us because it it uh, was able to kind of direct us in terms of what we did want to do, what we didn't want to do, who we didn't want to partner with, who we didn't want to partner with. Um, and, you know, most of our artists um, outside of our, our management clients have been really kind of from the ground up who, who you know, really had like, you know, 5,000, 10,000 followers when they started um, to now, you know, some of them being um, world recognized artists. So it's like, we really kind of took that approach, whereas, you know, that's not the approach for everybody. Some people might start a label and, and want to, um, you know, take on a certain, you know, genre or niche of the industry or, you know, represent a certain tier of artists or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it really depends. But um, for us, it was really focused on brand building and storytelling. And I did also just want to point out that uh, small difference with Def Jam and, and LVRN is just that. You know, I think we started out, we, we model ourselves a lot after Def Jam in the early days, but I think that um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> nah, no offense, no offense, but we're trying to get to the point where we sell our company the way that Def Jam did. So Def Jam is essentially, you know, owned by Universal, whereas LVRN is, is owned by myself and my four founders. Interesting. Um, is there something, you know, because you could give advice now, but is there something that you wish that you would have known today, you know, after doing everything that you've done? Well, I want to go back for a second and, and okay. I'm glad Junior brought, brought up storytelling and, and just for the artists that are watching this, I think understand that word. That's a really key concept because even with make, even for IG, it's the story you tell, you know, you just don't throw up some pictures and some videos. It should be telling a story, even going after a deal in your music. It's what is that story? I've met artists that are fine with just selling records when, you know, this is before in their region. They didn't care about being global. I mean, there's artists today that are like that are just fine with just having a certain celebrity where they're from. So understanding what that story is and telling that story, that's key first for whatever you're going to do, whether you're going to be your own label owner, an artist, have a story, you know, because that's what makes the difference. So I just wanted to emphasize that if there was a takeaway from this whole conversation, I think he summed it up, is storytelling. And, and that's just, that's imperative, essential. I can't even be on, you know, that's it. <laughs> yeah. um, for me, if I look back, I probably would have been him. <laughs> I made so many careers in my life. I probably should have did something for me. So, um, but I enjoy, you know, everybody has their station in life. I enjoy creating, uh, but I probably would have did that. That would have been the only difference. I'm all <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of artists right now too, who are launching their, their own labels or obviously already have them in motion. We see, you know, Rick Ross or MMG. Uh, Meek Mill, Dream Chasers, Travis Scott, Cactus Jack, and, uh, you know, the list goes on, Dreamville, G-Unit. Uh, but do you think this is uh, something that is is smart for the artists to do, or do you think it's worthwhile for, for them to uh, continue to create their own labels? 
anybody can weigh in on this one too. Um, I think so. I think I think it depends on the artist though. I think you just named a couple that are really, really enterprising, you know, business focused artists such as the Rick Ross, where it's like, you know, that's not every artist and that's okay. You know I mean? Some artists really, really are creatives and don't need to be running uh, a business that's, you know, essentially, you know, is the make or break for other people's lives, other artists' lives. You know, I, I really strongly believe that. I think that mm -hmm. for artists that do get into that, um, it's important that they surround themselves with people who are really, really um, hardworking go-getters, good with relationships, people that, you know, can be organized in a corporate sense, but they can also be creative and provide, you know, good feedback and, and you know, push the company forward creatively. And um, all these things are really essential. And it's like, you know, ha having a label or working at a label or whatever it is, it's like the label does a lot more than, you know, what one person can do. So I don't think that it's ever as easy as one artist saying, um, unless they're just talking about themselves and just they want to, you know, essentially run their own career. But other than that, they really need great partners in order to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that was actually my next question. Uh, what sort of partners uh, sh should they look for in order to kind of really get this thing off the ground? Because if, you know, it, it's really hard to, to get it moving without those kind of partnerships. I think this is a two, two of us can answer, but my first thing yeah. would be like-minded individuals. So if you're starting your own, it's a business, you know, yes, it's fun and the, the glitziness, the parties, all that stuff that you see in front that's one thing but it behind it's a business so understand and even for your own career that you have to put the work in have an objective have some goals and and treat it like a true entrepreneur in a business that would that would be what i would say everybody should be like minded on that yeah and understand their roles you may have someone that's just the creative person that's fine define the roles but everybody has to understand we have one goal to get to. Do you uh, do you guys look at, at artists who it's kind of rare who really go fully independent? They they don't go with it, an independent label. They don't go with a major. Maybe for example, very early on, like a Chance the Rapper. Um, would you would you advise artists to do that? And and if not, how come? How risky is that? Uh, that's very risky. Um, you know, I think early on, you know, it might not be risky at all, just depending on where you are in your career. But I think at a certain part point in time, you need partners to reach your full potential, whether that's a major label, a great manager, or a management company, or like whatever it is, there's there's always um, a level of partnership that can increase the pie that you have, is, is what I always say. And I think that, you know, depending on the artist and the level of resources to them, also kind of determines that risk. I don't know if a chance the rapper at that time in his career, I don't know if um, the type of resources he had is available to every independent artist. Um, you know, I don't know if the timing, you know, timing, so many different things play into, you know, the level of risk, but um, yeah, I think, I think it is very, it, it can be risky, um, but then there's, again, on the other side, there's, there's certain tools that are supposed to you know, level the playing field now with whether you're talking about, you know, social media, digital tools, um, metaverse type things, you know, like there's things that we now all have access to that we're all, you know, trying to learn about and learn how to utilize effectively. And if you're an artist who utilizes those things better than an artist that doesn't like to do anything on online, you know, you might be in a better position to push yourself forward than the artist that literally just wants to make music in their basement, you know, so it's like, it really depends on who you are as an artist, what type of resources you have, um, and how you can utilize those resources yourself to determine the risk, in my opinion. Charlene, do you feel like if an artist was willing to take that risk, uh, is it easier for them now in, in 2022 versus, you know, the late 90s? Is, is, that, a, is that a better route? Yeah, it, it is definitely easier today because we have all of these platforms. Before, if you had to do it, you had to physically go out and do it. You had to make everybody a believer in person. And I'm not saying those traditional marketing ways aren't effective today because they are. It just depends on your audience. People still want to, you know, rub, shake hands and kiss babies. You still should do that. Fans want to still have that up close and personal moment. 
Um, and especially now while we're in the pandemic and everything is just so far removed. So I would say it's easier today, but don't neglect the things that some artists had to do before. It's, it's all still very helpful. Yeah, we are getting so many gems here at the Pepsi Music Lab Summit, uh, demystifying major label versus independent. I have Charlene, who's the VP of Marketing at Def Jam, and Junior, co-founder of LVRN, uh, aka Love Renaissance. Um, Charlene, when you sit down with aspiring artists for the first time and you discuss potentially working with them, uh, what do you look for in them? What qualities are you looking for in them that's beyond the music? Hunger. Like something in their eyes that just show that there's a real desire and hunger. And they just, if, if you come to me and it's just about my socials are at a million and that should be enough, then I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> so I see Junior shaking, he's going, yes, exactly. No, that's, it's not enough. You have to put the work in. I need you to be wanting to get up and do some press and get some media training. I need you to want to understand you need performance coaching because it's bigger than just doing a show in the neighborhood hood spot. It's about, I want to see you at a festival in Hong Kong or wherever. Like, you know, the, I, I want to see those things for you. Like that's, I'm an envisioning, you're helping you envision in your career also, but in order to get there, you have to want to do the work. And, and sometimes you get artists that, that that's not it. They think it's just easy. Like here, here's my music, put it out. It should work. Yeah. No, that's not yeah. it. So Charlene, is there ever a time where you guys have to kind of sit back and be patient and, and wait for an artist to, to kind of develop? Yeah, um, there's several times like that and, and we're not opposed to it. So we understand some artists need a little bit more time. We have signed artists that don't have the most astronomical social numbers, which is fine, but there's something that we saw, something that we believed in, um, you know, I, I, we always want to try to be ahead. So we are going to start, we would look at artists that may not be what the trend is now, but we feel like this is what it will lead to. So we'll sign those type of artists and we'll start, develop them, have them at a, like, a, I won't say smaller scale, but like kind of an incubation phase, test some records out. Um, because we are in this content driven era, put out a lot of content, see how that's received. We'll try to build, we're doing that in a sense to build up the algorithm and get the exposure. And if something does kick off or something sets fire, we'll be right there to amplify that fire. That's that's the benefit of being at the major too. Um, and, and some indies as well, I'm not gonna say it's just us, are able to amplify once we see that little spark come. And we'll take that and make it into something bigger and continue the process. I know, Julia, for you, it, it could be uh, a little bit, a little bit of both, right? Because you, you definitely have to make it worthwhile running an independent like Love Renaissance. So when you're thinking of some of signing someone, are you, um, how much are you taking into account the analytics and, and the data or, um, and how much are you weighing in on your gut and, and believing in that artist? You know, we definitely take analytics into account. I, I don't want to say we don't consider it at all. To be very honest with you, what ends up happening is that, you know, as a smaller label um, who has a partnership with the with the major, um, but can go different ways, you know, more times than not, we have a smaller budget to be able to upfront um, offer an artist, just to, to be real. And so a lot of times when you're getting into um, competition with, uh, with artists, it's about the ones that have more of a more of something going for them, whether it's, you know, something trending on, on a Spotify or Pandora or, you know, they're going crazy on TikTok or whatever it is. And so it's like, we know that for us, where we shine is, is in the, the bringing the artists up from the ground. Because if we're discovering it there, we're not necessarily <clears throat> in competition with a, with a, with a major label who's going to offer more money than we probably are going to just as, as, as the way we're structured. And that's, and that's just the honest truth. And so, you know, it's not that we don't take KPIs into a, into, into account. It's just that we know where our sweet spot is. Um, but, but I mean, that being said, we definitely, definitely look for, you know, what type of songs are, are moving for the artists. Like, you know, especially if you have somebody that's like, 
you know, plays in a, a few different genres. It's like, okay, what are we getting ourselves into here? Like what kind of songs are fans really responding to the most right now? You know, like, like where, where, what is the story we're trying to tell um, is more so where we're, we're pulling the KPIs to, um, to kind of, you know, uh, influence how we see those things. Um, but yeah, we definitely take those things into account. Like Charlene said, hunger is a huge one. Oh my God. Like, you know, talent and like hunger is two different things. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's completely different. And, and, you know, I've been on hunger, you know, any day of the week. So we definitely uh, tap into that. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, how much the artist understands where they want to be, you know, so that we know whether we're aligned in that vision, you know, if the artist wants yeah. to be the most creatively, um, <clears throat> you know, creative, critically acclaimed, I'll say, artist in the world that doesn't necessarily reach the masses, that might not be what our focus is at the time of the late, you know, and so maybe that's not the time for us to work with them. Um, you know, it just depends, you know, we, we have to understand where the artist wants to be so that we know and we can be clear and we can be sure that we're those people to help them be that person. That, 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 that's a little bit interesting because some people would think that it, it's the other way around, right? Because with, with independent labels, some people assume like, you know, there's very little margin to, to mess up and to get this wrong. So when you go in, you, you got to go in and feel like, you know, people assume that you have all the data, everything looks like it's going to go the right way and maybe not so much bank on, you know, just the gut. You're, you're, you're looking at these numbers and hoping that they do what they're supposed to do. Whereas with a label, they go to the numbers and, you know, majority of the time and say, okay, yeah, this looks like it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And they, they rely on those heavily. Um, but Charlene, I can ask you this because this kind of data is, is, is a little bit newer and we've seen these things change throughout the year. So how have the, the labels began to embrace this, this change more? Um, in terms of relying on the data? Yeah, relying on the data, on social media, on DSPs. Oh, I mean, it's TikTok now. <laughs> <laughs> all it takes is one. <laughs> yeah, or, or, you know, I, man, that was a saying back in the days. All you need is one. Yeah, TikTok is leading this now. We're all like, oh, what's that on TikTok? <laughs> um, it, you, we rely heavily. We rely heavily. Am I going to say that that, but you, you have to have a balance. You just cannot do that because we all, um, I'm sure for myself and Junior, you can do that and as, and it'll be a trend and that, and trends end. <laughs> so you got to have some substance behind the trend. So it's just, it's, yeah, that we, you know, I, I don't really know how to explain it too more than saying, yes, that's, it's all about the numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we're a business at the end of the day, no matter what, this is a business. So we're about the business. However, we also understand that we have to be about substance. So we'll have a balance. We'll have artists that we are developing. We have artists that talent and has some numbers. And then we have no, we have some that are trends. And um, at, at least with Def Jam, you know, we have we have a, an amazing legacy. So a lot of those artists, the LLs, the Fabs, the Jada Kiss, the Jeezy, they're still there. And and it's that's about the music, right? They, we know that they deliver a certain quality. So it's just we have different pockets when it comes to artists. In this day and age, because you said, you know, the trends end at some point. But um, how often do you guys right now come across uh, people who are just organically dope artists? Is it, you know, more often than than not? Or because I feel like it's tough to figure out if an artist is dope. Um, you know, in the early stages, if you hear them just on TikTok or, you know, see something trending. So um, how often do you, do you guys really try to come across those artists that maybe weren't weren't trending at some point? Um, you know, it's not that often where you were, you know, in my experience where you, we find somebody that we're genuinely like, oh, shit, like this person truly gets it. Um, you know, but, you know, it's hard because there's so many more artists, I feel like, every year there's, you know, the, the, barriers, the uh, barriers to entry just, like, decrease and decrease. So it's like, you know, 
you're listening to and receiving so many different artists and music that it's like, you know, it kind of, it's bound to feel like you're finding a needle in the haystack a lot less commonly, I think. But um, but when when we do find those people, it's like it's it's you know, you know, we 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 found somebody recently who um kind of changed my perspective on it because it wasn't just us asking um if they made amazing music or if they you know had good ideas you know it was like oh wow this person shot these videos herself in her room she taught herself how to you know boom 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 she's her own creative director the music is amazing it's like because there's so many more tools available so it's like there's like a new level of like oh shit, that we're finding ourselves you know coming across where it's like wow like this artist truly truly gets it not only do they make amazing music understand their brand they know how to market themselves they know how to create their own videos within you know a small budget in a way that really resonates they they're just dope across the board and that's like a new level of like you know of shit that, you know i'm not necessarily I, can, I can't necessarily say that i've seen a lot of so I want to touch on a little bit with with Summer Walker because, you know, she's an artist that that, you know, we heard of, but she didn't, you know, make make I guess social media wasn't that big of a deal when she was really starting out. You know what I mean? So she's been putting in work, obviously, behind the scenes for quite some time. But what did early conversations uh, between you guys and Summer Walker look like in terms of getting her with La Renaissance? Um, Those early conversations were. um so there was a, you know, her manager at the time um, introduced us to her. Um, she had an amazing voice, amazing, amazing voice. Um, she was very, very shy. And so the initial meeting that we had um, actually just felt like, you know, like it might, the partnership might not work essentially, um, but we stayed in contact. Um, you know, she had certain KPIs that like, you know, we're showing some traction in terms of, um, you know, she, she, you know, would sing covers on YouTube and things like that. Certain videos had like a decent amount of traction, nothing crazy, nothing viral, but she had like, you know, just that under kind of like underground, like people like her vibe. Right. Um, but the talent was just like immense, you know, her pen was just insane. And it was just like, you know, by the time we got around to meeting her the second time and her like, um, the start of what was going to end up being her first project last day of summer, it was like, this is, this is amazing. Like, this is a different level. And so from there we were off to the races, you know? Um, but it was really, really, you know, there, like I said, there was, there was certain KPIs that, that looked really cool. And there was certain, um, there was a certain energy around it that was really cool, but the talent just spoke for itself with her. And Charlene, can you kind of weigh in? Uh, because, you know, early you were there for a 3-6 Mafia, which uh, mm -hmm. obviously icons, legends in, in mm -hmm. hip hop. Uh, what was that process like? Uh, I can only imagine it was it was a little bit different than what Julia described. Little. Little. <laughs> <laughs> what Julia little. described for Summer Walker. You do realize, like, Facebook is what? Instagram is how? <laughs> is it even 10, <laughs> 15? <laughs> little, very, very different. Hey, no um, MySpace, nothing. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> um, and, and that you could say that's just 2000. That's not even, we don't got to go out of 2000 and say that much. Right. Three Six Mafia, uh, when I rallied for them, was what they were doing in their region. So they were signed to Selecto, which was like this indie label in the Midwest South region. And it was under Triple Six Mafia. So they released a song, Tear the Club Up, Thugs. And like I was saying, I would travel, I would hear this record. And I was like, yo, what is this? I'm, and I'm born and raised in New York. So All right. it, just even that, but it was just different. You'll look in the, you'll be in the club and you're like, what is this record and the way the people are reacting. So when we got the opportunity to, uh, to sign them, I went and I pulled SoundScan. Yes, that's dated <laughs> <laughs> but it it sold 200,000 records here's a single with 200,000 records and for the, the the people watching this to get to 200,000 records is not easy today because it streams and it's um 
umpteen amount of streams before you get to one record sold. So I'm talking about 200,000 records sold on a single. And I went into the meeting and was like, if they can do this on their own, in their little probably three, five markets, Memphis and the surrounding areas, if we sign them, just imagine what we could do. And we did that. We put out that first album, Sipping on Syrup, million records, like sold, not streams, a million records sold. And it just went from there. Oh my goodness. So iconic. It was just, it was, it was the lifestyle. It was the people. It was the culture. Mm-hmm. Seeing those reactions is what I was like, we got to do something here. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, three, six mafia, they are still uh, very much, you know, involved in hip hop today. And, you know, it's just, uh, they're, they're a group that, that I love. I value everything that they've done for, for our culture, man. So shout out to Charlene paying attention to that record. <laughs> Being out in the clubs. <laughs> you gotta be outside. You gotta be outside. You definitely can't sit behind a desk and think we're going to find everything. You gotta be outside a little bit. <laughs> right. You gotta be outside a little bit before you two get out of here. This question is for both of you and, uh, Julia, you can start first. Do you think majors and independents need each other to survive? I absolutely think so. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, in order for us to have the wealth of, uh, different types of music and artists that we have, you need both, you know, I, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that like, obviously, you know, we, we have a partnership with a major that like major labels are inherently like bad the way that you know the narrative gets painted a lot of times especially nowadays i think that charlene has has you know educated people like hopefully they understand how how a, a major label works and can and can take an artist and amplify it to your point um the way that you know like i said before a major label really really has resources and like a wealth of history that is not always, you know, accessible to a smaller company. Um, and then I think that smaller companies are, are super important to, you know, to have that aut- autonomy or, or, you know, sometimes just that kind of, you know, element of not giving a because they don't have to give a about, you know, appealing to anybody above them um, where they can take more risks and they can, uh, you know, might be able to groom a different type of artist than, um, than a major can. So I think they both have their spaces, you know, and they're both very, very important to those spaces. Charlene, I'll let you weigh in from from that major side. (laughs) You know, people, like you said, there's a stigma where everyone feels like the major majors are going to be obsolete. I I don't believe that. I don't, I think even just for a major and independent, it's the climate, it's the technology, it's the consumer um, that's going to dictate where either one of us as entities are going, right? We need each other. Let's look at Def Jam. If we just want to go with the history of Def Jam, it started in a dorm room, which is as indie as you probably could get, right? Um, to where now it's, 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 it's part of Universal. It's not a JB, it's Def Jam Universal, right? So it, it had to start somewhere. And I think that's the balance that we all, we all need. It's the the creativity and the ability the to take the risk and chances that the indies give and then here's the major where we're like the resource and and the ability to just amplify your dream so i think we work hand in hand it's probably if another example it's the same people probably won't even know this show but they just had showtime video music box and an mtv the difference between those two for us was video music boxes where you played your videos and you can curse the, the today's era of world star, right? Where you can have booty shaking and cursing and MTV was, no, we need you to blur everything down to whatever that little check is on your shirt. So, you know, there's, that's the difference between the two, but one needed the other because you needed both elements. You needed to have the world star or the video music boxes to give artists just their complete originality. But then yes, we're gonna have the MTVs and the Viacoms so that we can get that global reach. And it's the same for the indie and the major. 
is you need both of those worlds to exist so that we can, for just everyone on the outside, every consumer, be able to give you all of this art. We have to be able to give it to you, right? Our jobs over here is once we have the music, it's for me, marketing, my job is to give it to you. Well, I hope everybody, you know, who has been tuned in has now is now able to understand the difference, you know, between a, a major and an independent and, and how they function. Uh, thank you so much, Charlene and Junior, for your time and, and dropping so many gems. And, you know, hopefully people are a little bit more educated on, on what they heard and, and the route that they might be thinking about taking. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Listen, don't forget to visit PepsiMusicLab.com for updates surrounding this year's Pepsi Music Lab Summit, as well as follow Pepsi on all socials and checking out the hashtag Pepsi Music Lab Summit. Mm -hmm.